I remember some cases early on in the United States and Massachusetts where there was very little knowledge in the pediatric healthcare community about how to treat children with high blood levels. And I especially remember two little boys. Now, you know, I was in the public health department. I never met these children, um, but the two little boys were never treated. They had blood blood levels. Now we would put them in the hospital and they'd stay there for a week, but they walked around with blood blood levels should be less than five on average about 60 or one of them average about 80 for the other for years. And they did not come out of that without any impact. I mean, they've had significant impacts on their life as a result of that. Now that they, these children are in their mid thirties and they, you know, they've been to jail several times and they didn't graduate from high school and all the things that we say. And I just remember them. Um, and I think about them a lot. The first was um, uh, two cases of patients with lead poisoning when I was a, a junior doctor in training um, in which the diagnosis of lead poisoning was not immediately apparent. And, and these really illustrated the potential for lead to cause significant problems throughout the body in many different body systems. And the fact that the diagnosis can often be a difficult one to reach and, and that there's a, a need for increasing awareness of lead as a clinical problem. I will pick up a group of cases who come to me with the like abdominal pain, the symptoms are severe abdominal pain, constipation, or even they have been hospitalized for that. And uh, there is a lot of uh, investigations have been done so much so that even uh, they have undergone CT scans, pulposcopies uh, to rule out cancers. And finally, you know, something strikes the doctor and he gets a blood lead level done. In one instance, more or less at the same time as I am talking to you, there's a small three months young baby which was brought to me with convulsions. By the time we measured the blood lead level, the child was no more. It had convulsions. It had died in my arms. That I cannot forget. I had decided there might be millions of such children in developing countries because the child's parents were working with lead even before they got married. After they got married, lead from their environment, food, we entered the pregnant lady. It went, there's no placental barrier. The child got enough lead. You soon after its birth, it had convulsions, neurological problem, but it died at the age of three months. This is one instance. Another instance of 65 year old man. He was preparing food at home. He had a grinder at home. His grinder had lead. Lead from the grinder uh, came into his food and he suffered from lead poisoning. It was very, he got into renal failure eventually. End stage renal disease, he died. These are the two extremes in between this two age group. A lot of people are consuming traditional medicines, folk medicines, getting into lead poisoning. And unfortunately, we do not have in these countries, developing countries, centers to evaluate blood lead level. That is very much required. There is no way to find out how much lead is there in their blood. In 2010, in Nigeria, there was massive uh, uh, lead poisoning in uh, northern part of Nigeria were called Zamfara State. It was huge. It attracted the attention of CDC, it attracted the attention of uh, WHO. Um, uh, some WHO staff and uh, CDC staff were sent to Nigeria. And uh, I remember I did a few things with them while they were here. People in Zamfara State lost over 400 of their children to severe lead poisoning early on in the outbreak. Um, and there's a cohort of children who survived that outbreak but have serious neurological and behavioural consequences. Plus, the background lead levels in Zamfara State are still um, quite high by international standards, so you've still got um, population level impact subclinically. Um, on a population that is already extremely disadvantaged and marginalized. The case that stands out the most is it's a family, it's a family of three generations that work with they they work around the, the house with um, battery recycling. And adults, young adults and children had severe uh, lead poisoning. Children's required hospitalization and 
even chelation treatment. And one of the things that I remember most was that the family, uh, the, the, the young people and the children had no education at all because they uh, felt that they weren't able to learn. And they were uh, convinced that they had a genetical disease, but never thought that lead could be culprit. The WHO guidelines provide evidence-based information on the diagnosis and management of lead poisoning. They provide guidance on the management of lead poisoning in different age groups and poisoning with different degrees of severity. The new WHO guideline will be a handy tool uh, for physicians who are practicing in the um, Sub-Saharan Africa. It contains expert opinions of the practitioners from different countries, different parts of the world, you know, the facilities and tools for management of lead poisoning, for diagnosing uh, lead poison uh, cases. So uh, they are different. Uh, all of these ha have been considered in this guideline. I think these WHO guidelines are really timely in producing evidence-based guidance to clinicians public health bodies and policymakers to standardize the approach to this significant clinical issue. The doctors who are treating the patients, they will have standard protocols from these guidelines that how to treat, when to treat and what antidotes to, should be given. So all that will be available in one place. I think that the uh, WHO guidelines will help stabilize the uh, the supply of the chelating agents. Um, they are increasingly difficult to come by in the United States and in many other countries. And I'm hopeful that the country countries will use the information on the chelating agents in the document to um, inform their decisions about which ones of these medications will be on their formularies. Prevention is really important in lead poisoning. And, and I think we really need to stress that in those with a raised blood lead concentration, whilst treatment with, with, with medicines such as chelation therapy can be important, by far and away the most important aspect of management is identification and removal of the source of lead. And I think the guidelines get this across really well. I, I think that these guidelines are very welcome for many, many a group of health professionals that are worried about lead poisoning and also for those that are not aware that lead poisoning is a threat for children's and adult health.